everybody, and welcome to Untamed Unfiltered. I'm Amanda Nicholson. I am Aaron Provencio, and today we are joined by two special guests, Lydia Price and Kate Gunther. How's it doing today? Great. Hey. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for joining us this week uh, as we take a deeper dive into our backyard habitats. So just so all of our viewers know, Kate uh, was once a front desk coordinator at the Wildlife Center, and she is a master naturalist and knows all things about plants and animals and outdoor life and uh, a variety of other things. And full disclosure for everyone, Lydia Price is my mother. <laughs> so this is episode four of Untamed Unfiltered, talking about episode five of Untamed season two, which is backyard habitats. So today we're going to talk a little bit about habitats and I'm curious, Lydia and Kate, what are the habitats like where you all are from? Oh yeah, well I live in a very rural countryside here in the western part of Virginia and I'm really lucky to live in a habitat that has lots of different kinds of, of habitat right around me including open fields and deciduous woods, evergreen woods, uh, streams, and I and I also have a really large wetland right across the road from my house. So I'm really lucky. And my current habitat is a ridge of a mountain. Actually, it's a top ridge of a mountain where we moved to retire about three years ago. Built a log home. So like Kate, I have a lot of natural habitat around me. Not, the quite, not quite the same as hers. But I'm, we're surrounded by basically three sides of woods and then to the east of us is some open field but that's not our territory or our habitat it's a valley with a lake but having had all the woods naturally there's lots of things already there like woods that have fallen naturally that have made great cover for wildlife and all kinds of tree leaf litter but we have sloping sides that I made into habitat and wildflower garden. And we have a clearing in the back. And I remember Amanda asking me, what are you gonna do with that? Cause it was all dirt from where they built the house. And I thought about it and said, well, we're not planting grass. I'm not taking care of grass. I want it naturalized. So I planted all perennial native sustainable gardening type plants because I wanted a free bee garden, birds bee butterfly. And I can get into more of that later, but, and we put a pond in. That's important. We build up about 11 foot by seven foot on. Oh, oh. Awesome. Well, you both have very nice habitat. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so Kate, uh, years ago, you actually set up the Wildlife Center's Certified Wildlife Habitat, uh, which is something that was touched on in, on this, uh, in this episode of Untamed, um, just going through the certification process and what that really means. Um, when you decided to do that for the center, what, what made you do that? I guess, what made you take that project on? Mm, yeah, well, when I was working at the center, um, I was the person who met people when they first came in the door. So I did a lot of education with the public about things like Renesting healthy babies and also a whole lot of problem solving for the kinds of wildlife issues that the folks were having in their own backyards. And I just wanted to have an immediate area right in front of the hospital that could be kind of a demo habitat and that I could use that and so could our education staff. Um, and I could use it kind of as a show and tell exhibit, so to speak, so that people could visualize some wildlife friendly habitats right as we were talking together and I could point at things and, and have a, an example for them to, to see. Very cool. And Lydia, you have a certified habitat as well. Well, you know, if I can back up just a minute, I remember when Kate was doing that project and um, I had talked to her, I'd met her online, but then I was still visiting the center then before I started volunteering there. But I talked to her and I wanted to do that in the home we lived in in Pennsylvania. I actually, she got me very motivated to certify it. 
So I won't talk in a lot of detail about that. It was in a development and very different than what I have now. But I remember Wildlife Center having some online discussion about it and I learned the components of what it takes to create a wildlife ha habitat and looked at some things online she pointed me to. And where it leads into my current habitat is when I decided to put in a pond and it was the first project Doug and I, my husband and I really did by ourselves, except for we had somebody dig it, but we put it all in. And my goal was to attract native frogs because I love the sound of them. I knew we had them around and I wanted to attract them. And Kate had advised me if I wanted to attract native frogs, not to put in non-native fish. So I didn't. And we have hordes. Within the first month of putting in that pond, the tree frogs started to come down. Next thing you know, we have a green frog. By the next year, we had every kind of frog that lives around here, I think. We have a lot of resident bullfrogs and the spring peepers and the tree frogs and our breeding frogs and pickerel frogs. And I never did end up putting fish in. I'm very happy with my frog pond. So, um, but all of the other components, of course, there is an online, and Kate, I'm gonna need you. What, what is the online location where people can look that up? Yes, it's the National Wildlife Federation website has information about their uh, how to get to be a certified backyard habitat, I believe. So when you were going through the process of, you know, finding those resources and then eventually, you know, starting to get the, the habitat set up, were there any challenges that you had to overcome when setting up your, your habitat? I sure did. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to think back to the challenges. Um, that, you know, for us, it was the challenges were not so much about the habitat, but we were trying to design by committee and get a lot of people involved and make it both a, a, a project that we were installing, but also an education project for the group of people that was going through doing it, all the volunteers. And uh, we were working with a group of master naturalists at the time, so we were involving, you know, I, I can't remember how many people got involved with that project, but we probably had 30 to 40 people involved with the project in one way or the other because we had different people doing different components. One, we had a pond group that worked on designing and figuring out the pond. We had another group that was designing and uh, building nest boxes uh, to be demonstration nest boxes. We had another group that was uh, doing signage for the Wildlife Center and designing and writing the copy for these permanent outdoor signs that were going to de describe the whole, um, how the whole thing tied together. So that was really the big thing for me was just kind of coordinating all the uh, different players. But, but each of those groups had to figure out, you know, had their own challenges to figure out for any site. Because like any place, every site's going to have its own unique challenges from either you know, what type of soil you've got to what the light is like or whether you're in a very windy area or if you're in a, you know, more protected area. So, you know, every place is going to have its challenges that you're going to have to design around. What about you, Lydia? Oh, um, yeah, I had some unexpected challenges. I did the traditional things, got all the flowers in, lots of native um, plants that I either knew people here that were thinning gardens and gave to me and I found a great local gardener who sells a whole section of the stores, nothing but native plants. And there are places online too. Got all that in, got my bird boxes up. The bluebirds were happily settling in and laying eggs. And then one day we came home and um, there were pots that I had plants in sunk into the bog part of my pond and they were pulled out and pulled across our patio and I could see teeth marks on them. I knew we live in bear country and I knew we risked bears coming. I always thought they might get in and tear the liner, so we were watching for that. But no, it came in and just pulled all my plants out. So when I, my first challenge was, okay, what can I put in this pond for some pond cover and native things for the frogs that the bears won't tear out? So I went to floating plants mostly, except for what already had rooted in the bottom. So that was the first challenge. And I guess the rest of the challenge is I just never anticipated that, of course, I put water in my backyard. We have some streams, but they're not on our property. And we have a big lake. But the animals around here were happy with the ponds. So it, it was like I had a sign up that said, all the forest, you're welcome. Here's your watering hole. 
bears, raccoons, fox, doe, buck, you name it. We have, so we put a game cam on the pond after the first year and figured that would be wise. Just so we could see what was there if we had something to repair, but so far it's been fine. And that's really been the only challenge, except for the multiple groundhogs I have now who I didn't know enough in the beginning to study groundhog resistant plants. This year I'm finding out now that we're into our third year and everything's really growing and spreading. There are certain plants that I like very much that the groundhogs do too. So they're pretty much eating them up. So I've studied what kind of plants don't they like to eat. So that's my next project. <laughs> so definitely a case of if you create it, they will come. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> and there's another thing I wanted to just toss in that, that Lydia said something that made me think of. And uh, the Chris um, Bolin, who's in your video, is was on our team of, of people who helped. Mm -hmm. And she helped design what native plantings were going to go into the Wildlife Center garden. And I remember Chris said something that uh, was instructive to me back then, and it's uh, I've, it sort of stuck with me that, you know, you, you plant a whole bunch of things and you kind of try to choose what you think is going to work. But in the end, the, the site will pick the plants and the mm -hmm. plants will pick the site. And so if you put in 12 different things that you think are good, maybe 10 of them will live and do well there, or eight of them will. But, uh, you know, so you should kind of expect that. Don't expect to um, know exactly what's going to work. Um, just do the best you can and, and let nature take over. So Kate, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Chris. Uh, she was the master naturalist who appeared in this episode and, and Kate got us in touch with her um, just to think through more habitat stuff. And one of the things that Chris really talked a lot about and uh, both of you have brought up as well is the importance of native plants in developing a wildlife habitat. Um, and Chris had this great, um, little segment where she talked about them, uh, thinking about them as a whole system, basically that, you know, it's a whole food chain, food web system going on in there. Um, insects are attracted to native plants and then the birds are attracted to the insects and, and it just is kind of this nice little complete thing. Um, so I'm just curious if, if you can talk more about that. Um, what are we really thinking about with native plants? And I guess what, what causes the non-native plants to be less balanced? Because they can certainly be really pretty, but maybe not as ideal overall for our habitats that we're developing. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, Amanda. Um, you know, when a, when a plant is brought in from another part of the world and it first comes here, it either dies or it survives under the new conditions that it finds itself in. And if it survives, it often survives because none of its usual plant predators and none of its competitors are here. They're back home. So it like grows like a weed, both literally and figuratively. And um, weedy plants in general are ones that can tolerate wide ranges of, of moisture and of light um, wide ranges of temperature, so they tend to thrive well all over the place. And um, like you just mentioned too, Amanda, homeowners tend to buy plants that are pretty, that are pest resistant, have a lot of uh, pretty berries on them, and um, often can tolerate harsh conditions. And those plants' qualities mean that those plants are so good at reproducing and surviving mm -hmm. that then they can easily just spread right on out into the wild. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of a community of native plants is that all the plants have co-evolved over millennia together. They've developed kind of a checks and balances on each other so that no one plant can get a monopoly on the system. And so it preserves diversity more. Um, and yes, you're also right that that system involves the insects and the animals too, and how they've all co-evolved with the plants over the eons. And one example of a problem for animals that are trying to live with plants that they have not evolved to live with is um, Multiflora rose. 
So birds love to make nests in the thickets of these multiflora rows, and to them, the thorny, shrubby habitat offers protection for their nest of babies. But it turns out that the growth pattern of multiflora rows is a lot more open than some of our native thorny plants. Mm -hmm. And it has just enough space in there for predators to move through it. So here the birds are, they think they're safe in this thorn bush, but in actuality, they're at an increased risk and a lot more of their babies are gonna get eaten. Hmm. So uh, that's an example of how by not co-evolving the animals with the plants, it, the system just doesn't work quite right. And so when we bring plants in from another place, it can take a long time for us uh, to kind of find out if that plant is gonna be invasive or not. Um, in the United States, we over time have intentionally introduced plants that we hoped were gonna be beneficial for wildlife. Uh, and they turned out to be invasive nightmares that now we can't get rid of. Mm -hmm. Things like autumn olive, uh, or some of the Lespedezas, or multiflora rose. So, you know, we've had some good intentions in bringing some of these plants in, but the result sure has been uh, a mixed bag at best. Mm -hmm. Well, all of this talk about how to cultivate, you know, native plants in a native habitat in your, in your backyard, on your land, it starts inviting in, you know, animals, you know, wild species that share the, the neighborhood or the area that you live in with you. And obviously when you're starting to invite those animals in, you, did, did you ever run into any issues with the safety of those animals? Did you have to make any modifications during the habitat process to help ensure that while the animals are visiting your habitat that you're helping create them, they're, that they're safe? Yeah, um, we, did, um, we did some construction on our house. We put a sunroom on our house and we just love that. But uh, after we built it, we had a really notable increase in bird window collisions, mm. all the glass. And um, of course that, that was um, intolerable to me, so I, researched all the products that I uh, could find on the market to, that were designed to help birds avoid hitting windows. And at the time that I did this, uh, there were at least four or five different products available uh, that, that were a range of prices. Um, some of them were kind of expensive, but others were cheaper. And, and then there's a whole bunch of homemade type things you can try that actually Ed talked about in the, in the show. Uh, he talked about hanging um, I think he said mylar strips in front of your windows. Um, I've heard about people like tying up pie pans and hanging those mm -hmm. too and they blow in the wind. Uh, but there's some other things that you can do that are not quite so homemade that are a little bit more of a permanent solution, but they do cost a lot more. And uh, so anyway, I researched all that and um, uh, we ended up applying something to our windows that is like a film and it uh, is a hundred percent effective really in stopping birds from flying into the window. It's amazing, it's, it's so good. Uh, and it still allows us to see out of the window. And it actually looks very nice on the house. So we were, uh, we were really happy about that. And um, I ended up installing something like that at the Wildlife Center too, just as a, another demonstration thing so people could see some of these different products that were available I if they wanted that. to try to put something in their own house. And if, um, if anybody's listening to this and they wanna see the different kinds of things that are out there. Um, the American Bird Conservancy and I think the United States Humane Society both have some online documents that do kind of some comparative pictures and, and things of the different products and you can kind of look at that and see what might fit your particular um, situation for your house. As for me, it would probably be things most people by now are already thinking of if they've watched Untamed in previous series, it, it would be bringing your bird feeders in in the spring because the birds don't really need the seed in the summer months and the bears certainly love it, as do the raccoons. We, even when we keep our seed out in winter, we bring them in at night because we've had raccoons come ravage them at night too. So rather than get mad at the wildlife who are naturally attracted to a food source, um, you have to be a little careful. Um, Things like if you've gotten used to, well, it's not good anywhere, but like avoiding blue cat traps because you want to keep the mosquitoes or the flies away, that's a really a big no-no. I mean, we have little fence lizards and skinks and snakes, and that would, that's just 
just devastate them. Wildlife Center knows all too well about those injuries. I um I think it's kind of interesting, Lydia, that you that you mentioned that um, you know you have the skinks and the bears and the raccoons and the birds and kind of everything. And and Kate, you sort of spoke to this earlier about how there's there's this natural diversity that you can help to um, help to improve in your natural habitat. And I think it's important for people to know, and we sort of talked about this when we were talking about our, our wild neighbors a couple episodes ago, but that when you start to, you know, invite your wild neighbors into the area by creating a natural habitat, a backyard habitat, that this diversity is going to happen. And can you kind of speak to the importance of that diversity, Kate? So I think that Chris sort of touched on this too in the show, but that diversity is so important because of, you know, one of the things that bothers people the most about sitting out their backyard is, is, is insects, right? You know, you get too many mm -hmm. insects, mosquitoes, but other things as well, ticks, um, just no see and gnats that get, you know, make it an uncomfortable experience. And, you know, insects are one of those things that is just a huge food source for so much of our wildlife. It's huge in, uh, for the bird population, but it's, uh, it's big for a lot of the mammals too. Um, you know, and frogs. depending on the different, yeah, and the frogs and the and amphibians, the frogs. right. And, mm -hmm. and depending on the stage of the larva of the insect, you know, they may be still in the ground as a larva, and that is a food for the mm -hmm. voles and the moles and shrews. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, we don't even think about that because we just think about the ones that are flying around. So to have, to make sure that these insects are all eaten up properly in the cycle, in the web, you'd want a big diversity of your bird species and of your uh, mammal species too, to kind of keep it all in that checks and balances. Because um, different, different birds eat different kinds of insects depending on the kind mm -hmm. of bills that they have and depending on their size, what kind of size of, of an insect they can handle and what kind of size uh, their babies can handle when they take something back to the nest. So again, it's a web and there's a, a sort of a predator and prey piece of the puzzle for all of these things. And the diversity is having all the pieces of the puzzle. You know, if you'd have a lower diversity, it's kind of like doing a puzzle with not all the pieces. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. I have a quote that kind of goes along with that. I brought it with me just in case it fit today. I read it in um, National Wildlife actually last month's June, July episode, but it says, here's your one health. If human beings disappeared tomorrow, the world would go on with little change. But if invertebrates were to disappear, I doubt that the human species could last more than a few months. By E.O. Wilson. Think about that. Interesting. Also interesting. I think this is going to be a goal this season that one health come up in every episode. Yeah. Uh, in, in a natural way, because so far it has. Also, yeah. like we were talking about, Aaron was talking about invertebrates um, a couple episodes ago too. So yeah, yeah it is funny yeah. how it's also our topics are about being connected, and then all of them connect together. And uh, okay. one, of, one of the other things that uh, Chris mentioned in her segment, which I was really glad to hear. And this is actually what's really fun for me this season is um, we have had so many great people participate in all of these episodes and we have like a rough outline and, and questions that our producer should ask of them. But I don't, I don't really know what people are going to say. So watching these episodes for me is like a fun little surprise sometimes when we're uh, in the editing process of like, oh my gosh, yeah, we like... If I had scripted it, maybe I, maybe I would have thought that far ahead to think to tell somebody to say that. But it's just you know, it's these are experts in their field, and um, and so one of the things that she said that I got excited by was this notion of bringing your backyard into your front yard and going along with you know native plants and thinking about your entire property that you want to make into a nice habitat because we often think, at least we as Americans maybe, um, often think about our backyard habitat. And I have even had to catch myself multiple times to not say backyard wildlife habitat. It just, something yeah. about it is, is what I would reach for. Um, but 
it's that notion of bringing stuff into your front yard, maybe cultivate something other than grass, cultivate native plants that are really useful to wildlife and the entire ecosystem. And um, I have not really cultivated a native plant garden or anything, but I was particularly glad to hear her say, bring your backyard into your front yard, because I am the weirdo on my block who has all of my uh, vegetable gardens in my front yard, because it's just, it's better sunlight there. It's also away from my backyard chickens, uh, <laughs> dogs, so like it gets undisturbed. So, but it is funny looking around. I'm like, oh, I'm <laughs> really trying to utilize all of my space and not just keep it like hidden in the backyard. So I'm just wondering if you guys in, in your own habitat, um, certainly at the Wildlife Center's habitat, our habitat's right there in our front yard, so to speak, for people to see. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And I'm glad Chris brought it up too. I, I think it's, it is just kind of a cultural convention we've got going on. And I don't know if it's limited to America or to the United States. Um, but I think psychologically, people just kind of think of the backyard as the private space where you actually do stuff. You know, oh, the kids right. run around and you wash the dog and you hang the, la the laundry out and work on your lawnmower or whatever. But um, people use their front yards a little bit more as a show space, you know, kind of to make a first good impression for visitors. Mm. And um, I don't think many of us think that way really consciously. But I think as a culture, we've kind of bought into that. I, I think I have too. Um, and if you decide to do something in your yard outside of that norm, then you know you might get a little bit of mild resistance or some some funny looks, like a you know like you're saying Amanda feeling a little bit like a weirdo in in your neighborhood. Um, there is this sort of perception that a really wild habitat is going to be messy looking uh, or less manicured than what has been considered to be kind of the ideal for the past 50 years or so in the United States. And uh, in some ways, I think that that may be somewhat true, that, um, you know, it may be a little less manicured looking. So mm -hmm. if somebody wants to create some wild habitat, they, they often just kind of hide it in the back. Um, but that means for a lot of wasted space in the front yards that could be developed into something more beneficial. Um, and it also misses out on being kind of using your front yard space as a model for visitors uh, and for people who are just passing by where they can see some alternatives and, you know, see some more diversity in, in how space can be used and what, what's possible. Well, before we let you go, um, we've, I think the two of you have done a great job of speaking to the many benefits that having a personal backyard or front yard or both yards habitat can have for area wildlife. But I'm curious, because both of you seem so passionate and interested in cultivating a habitat in your own property, what personal benefits do you get from having those habitats so near to where you live? I mean, why is it important to you to, to cultivate those backyard habitats? I just love to watch the wildlife and it's you know, I, I just want good habitat so that I can bring them into view so that I get a chance to, to bump in and see them more or at least see them on game cameras or, or something like yeah. that. I think, you know, probably the thing that has been the most exciting to me and my personal um, property is, is that we live just close enough to this marsh and um, that just brings so much richness into the neighborhood that I get to watch turtles lay eggs in my front yard mm. every year. And, uh, and then I get to sort of wait around all summer and, and time it out and learn about when they're going to hatch their eggs and, and go back to the marsh. And that's just not something I never anticipated. Before. Even when I was buying the house, I never thought about how much experience I would get just being able to watch the turtle cycles year after year. But it's been um, it's been really a remarkable thing, and, and that's just one, you know, species that I can name, but there's been lots of experiences like that that just, you know, are, have built a lifetime of memories around um, that I, you know, wouldn't get if I just wanted to go visit a habitat. You mm -hmm. know, I have to, you know, by living here, I get to bump into and see things that I would never get to see 
otherwise just because I'm here so much. And, you know, if you try to go somewhere else, the timing isn't usually right that you're there when the bobcat's there. But, but hmm. if I wait around and I'm patient enough here, I can yeah. usually get to see a bobcat. So pretty happy about that yeah. too. I agree with Kate. It, it's the, it's the pleasure and the joy. Well, okay, I purposely moved to an area where I could have more wildlife around me, and that's where I wanted to retire. And actually, if you really think about it, I intruded on their territory, and I know that. So I figure it is my responsibility to provide something to help further take care of them, since we took some of their land. So they're very happy with me in a big pond. I can tell that already. But um. It's, the, it's just the experience. It's the sound of the frogs at night. I probably drive Amanda crazy sending her videos for her dog to listen to because the sounds are so awesome. And you can hear them through all the walls of the house. And I just love falling asleep hearing just the sounds of frogs. Or it's so startling sometimes I'll look out the window and there's this great big black bear in my yard. And it doesn't feel real. Like, you're kidding me, there's this big bear. And then I think to run for the camera. And some of it, like Kate said, it's just you can't wait to see what you got on the game cam and what came to visit you you didn't know about. But it's waiting for my favorite box turtle. We saw the first year here, and so far it's been back here every spring, somewhere on its path to wherever it's going. But it crosses our driveway, and I've been lucky enough to see that. And it's just, I, I don't know, I can't describe it. It's wonderful. I think it would be very boring not to be able to look at it for those sites now. Well, thank you both so much for joining us for Untamed Unfiltered. Uh, I think that is it for this week. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we will see you next week. Okie dokie. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. <laughs> we'll make